Hello, my name is Stuart Grant, and I'm here with Quinn Hogan. And Dr. Hogan won the Gaston Levan Award in 2009, is that correct? And, uh, and we're talking to him tonight as part of an interview series we're doing to commemorate the 100th anniversary uh, of the, the founding of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. Um, and although the modern day ASRA is not related to that original meeting, we think it's a really great time to, to, to recognize what the founding of that organization did for regional anesthesia and current day pain medicine. So welcome, Dr. Hogan, pleased to meet you. Thank you, Stuart. What led you uh, into pain medicine and regional anesthesia? Uh, it was a bit of a circuitous uh, pathway. Um, I actually started after medical school uh, as uh, head, head neck surgery. I uh, did a couple of years at, at Barnes and realized that I'd rather be in the operating room full time than once or twice a week because I really enjoyed that environment. Mm -hmm. So I went back to where I knew my first anesthesia experiences uh, were at the Brigham uh, when I was a medical student there. And so I knew some of the people there. That was back in Leroy Van Dam's day and it had changed by the time I got back uh, as a resident after my detour to ENT. Uh, at which time Ben Cavino uh, was the new chair. And of course, that left its impression. It was very clear that regional anesthesia was the way to go and uh, that it was the wave of the future, uh, best for the patient, and uh, had many different uh, attributes that um, uh, we were taught. So I kind of come by that naturally. Um, after that, I went into private practice uh, for about eight years. Um, which not only paid off my debts, but also uh, I think it's, it's excellent to actually go out and do a lot of anesthesia, hands-on, do it yourself, get good at it and uh, find out what, you're, uh, what works for you, what doesn't work for you. But eventually I went back to academics because I felt really that's what I wanted to do. It was uh, more interesting. And after those eight years of uh, doing anesthesia, you know, it started looking kind of familiar and repetitious as we all know. At least if you're uh, doing it right, it should be uh, <laughs> a somewhat um, unentertaining process. So academics uh, was a lure to me. Um, I uh, shopped around. Uh, I was told, for instance, um, if you want to have a future in academics, and I believe this is correct, you really have to have something to offer in some sort of special area. You can't... You, generalists are valuable, uh, but if you can advance the knowledge base on a specific topic as well, uh, that uh, gives you a uh, path forward. Um, Steve Abram uh, was the director of the pain clinic at uh, MCW Medical College of Wisconsin, which is where I, where I came for my fellowship. Uh, and that was back in 1989. So uh, since then, I've been at Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, uh, after Steve uh, taught me pain. I eventually uh, was a director in uh, his as his successor, and I've been there ever since. So, um, 1989, that was the year I graduated medical school. Uh, I, and when you were getting into the field, what, what were the predominant issues? What were people talking about? What were the big debates when you started and when you went to Astro Society meetings in those days? Um, I, I think we were just at the point where we recognized we needed a longer acting uh, anesthetic. We were starting to recognize the limitations of uh, repeated doses of chloroprocaine and so forth. So bupivacaine was uh, uh, just coming uh, online then uh, and recognizing its potential uh, hazards as well. So I think those were uh, obviously very important topics. Um, we were in the process of uh, developing catheter techniques <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the recognition that we could put an epidural catheter in, keep it in for quite a while, and give repeated doses and pr produce prolonged uh, analgesia. And that was uh, being developed, uh, for instance, at the Brigham while I was there. Um, I think we were still doing intrathecal catheters, uh, which uh, had its day. Okay. As, uh, um, Dr. Cavino advanced the topic of epidural analgesia. Yes. I think we pretty much standardized uh, for epidural uh, choice uh, versus intrathecal. 
Um, and I think the main thrust was uh, the new recognition that we could use regional anesthesia uh, in combination with general anesthesia, for instance, or exclusively for ortho, um, as a way to alter outcomes and alter and to regulate uh, autonomic function, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, we, we weren't really thinking of avoiding opioids at that time, but it was uh, more, I think, stabilizing uh, the patient looking at endocrine uh, consequences of uh, uh, operative stress and using regional anesthesia to manage those less obvious uh, concerns. So I, I um, when you had epidurals, you had a technique that could last a long time. Did you have pumps for the epidurals or were you the epidural pump as a junior doctor? Um, it's a good question. You know, this is 40 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, well, in the operating room, we had a syringe and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, out in the wards, uh, there were pumps, but I, uh, never had to manage those. So I think mostly we, uh, had the pain service doing that. And I wasn't part of that until, uh, okay. so, um, I'll have to take a buy on that. But yeah. No, I, 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 <laughs> and, uh, I'm interested. I, I there's a, a group in Italy who, this day are, are using uh, intrathecal catheters. I just wondered uh, what, what your experience was like with, with, with experimenting with intrathecal catheters in those days. We hardly ever used it. I think yeah. uh, we had so much uh, uh, gone over to the epidural approach. Mm -hmm. uh, we were comfortable with that, it was safe with that. Um, uh, we knew that there was very unlikely possibility of trauma or uh, intra cord injection or damage of that nature. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't think it was used with any regularity at all uh, in my um, it, If you look back to then and, and then to now, um, you know, how do you think the field has evolved over your career? I know you touched on a little bit in your first answer, but what do you think the main evolution has been in, in the field over, over those years? Well, certainly um, we've moved from the neuraxis to the periphery, uh, plexus. Um, I, I think there's a lot of good reasons for that. Doing an epidural for a lower extremity uh, does a whole lot more anesthesia than you need. Uh, autonomic regulation, those lead to uh, or auto autonomic side effects, really, in this case. Um, the ability to uh, target individual limbs, I think, was uh, key in, to prolong the anesthetic. So, uh, I think that's a, a useful evolution. Um, epidural obviously uh, can do almost anything, uh, but often you don't need that much. Um, the catheter techniques have evolved. Uh, I think we were in a primitive state. Uh, we didn't have anything but uh, stiff plastic ones. Um, our techniques for inserting them, I think, uh, were capable, uh, though I think um, there's still room for uh, improvement with imaging or with pressure sensor uh, sensing devices and we had none of that of course it was thumb and um, we almost all educated thumb educated, really <laughs> educated, <laughs> educated by uh, multiple mishaps and the uh, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. when you're in the wrong place um the uh our our uh, strain of um uh, approach was to use uh, air loss of resistance. Mm -hmm. I think that was gradually losing popularity uh, uh, in those days. And um, I regret it because <laughs> having done uh, that during training, it was hard to switch to something that was a, a different feel and a different uh, strategy. But um, mm -hmm. uh, I actually did subsequently have an air embolism. It was actually uh, when I was doing a, uh, this was after I left uh, uh, residency. I was giving my wife actually an epidural steroid for her radiculopathy and ended up uh, giving her an air embolism, uh, which was dramatically painful. Uh, the, the, up the uh, intrathecal air I'm talking about, not mm -hmm. the vascular. So um, that, that I think was uh, something that perhaps did uh, wear out its welcome. As, uh, <laughs> many, of us, many of us changed to uh, a liquid uh, injection, a, a, a pressure sensing uh, mm -hmm. technique, yeah. Um, now it was 2009, and I know we're going back a bit, but do you remember who who, who let you know? It was by letter? Was it uh, a phone call? We found out you'd won the Labatt Award. 
Oh, yeah, and I, I was almost going to correct you about the 2009. It was 2008. In the 2008, was it? Well, both. Uh, mm -hmm. I got a phone call from uh, a secretary. I, maybe the office was in Chicago, but I, I, uh, she called up and said, do you have your reservations? Uh, and I said, well, I'm not going to this year's meeting. I have a conflict. And she said, well, you're giving the bar lecture. <laughs> said, well, <laughs> nobody told me. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so, uh, they they uh, found somebody. They, they switched the sequence. I'm not sure how they addressed it. Uh, and I said, well, uh, next year is fine with me. Uh, so uh, ah, uh, okay. in 2008 and uh, uh, gave the lecture in 2009. Uh, what was, this, what was this, the topic of your, your lecture in 2009? Well, I made it a very broad topic. I mm -hmm. think it was um, the dorsal ganglion, the sensory neuron of the dorsal ganglion, why we should uh, be interested in it, mm -hmm. um, what it does and how it does it. Uh, it's a very strange neuron after all, uh, yep. in a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, even now, what, how many years since? Uh, well, uh, 15, 16 years, uh, that is still the topic that I'm mostly researching, uh, which mm -hmm. Um, how to use that as a therapeutic target. Yeah. So um, I, it was an opportunity to blab on about various experiments I'd done and uh, what I'd learned about calcium uh, in these neurons and uh, the, the possibility of uh, injuring them in various ways and uh, mm -hmm. uh, how therapies might be approached. Now, you get your clinical practice and, and the, the science you do, you know, what changes are, are thinking and practice or what sort of perspective uh, have you tried to foster and, and others you've worked with and trained through the years? Um, now, as far as my Laba Award um, topics or... Just your, no, topics, just your... <laughs> yeah, um, just your, your as, a, as a scientist or a clinician, when you're talking to, to other uh, mentees, junior yeah. faculty... Um, well, uh, chronologically in my academic career, I sort of um, uh, marched uh, through the phylogeny of science, uh, starting with anatomy, uh, because um, even as a resident, it seemed to me that uh, anesthesia anatomy just wasn't very well presented in the textbooks. I remember looking, for instance, at the um, Fouffier's line. And I couldn't remember where Tufier's line was. Um, so I looked at a couple of different books and the different books had Tufier's line at different levels. So they uh, had nice pictures, but uh, no data. Uh, and anatomic data uh, in the spaces that we look at uh, is kind of hard to come by. Uh, for instance, even the epidural space, uh, if you look at it directly like the surgeons do, you've already uh, dramatically changed it uh, because everything which is held in place and fluid structures, uh, the lipid kind of splashing around. It isn't, isn't uh, once you open it up, uh, where it was uh, when you poke it with a needle. Mm -hmm. So um, that was also about the time where technology was uh, evolving to allow a better uh, estimation of uh, anatomy, for instance, uh, MR. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things about MR and our, our medical school was a, a very early adopter and developer of uh, MR imaging. And um, I worked with a guy named Vic Houghton, who was a senior radiologist. Uh, he, um, they were used to looking at CTs, uh, axial images. So everybody knew what an axial image uh, looked like. But with MR, you could do it at any plane. And for instance, they had things in oblique planes in the neck, and they were wondering, well, what is what? So they bought uh, one of the world's few uh, sl uh, massive sledge microtomes. It's a frozen section microtome, just like the pathologist might use, except you can feed a frozen human into it. Uh, in other words, it's this huge thing wow. that uh, slices off uh, uh, little layers. And as you go, it, it allows photographic um, high resolution images of human anatomy uh, in sequences, which then, of course, because those are two dimensional, you have to integrate into a three dimensional kind of concept, which radiologists are getting very good at. And uh, for that matter, so were computers in those days. So uh, just beginning to figure out how to do uh, three-dimensional image processing. Of course, it was a very big computer, not a little laptop, but uh, uh, that allowed um, uh, resolving uh, where things are in humans because uh, in combination with that, we had a very successful uh, donor program uh, for 
um, anatomy uh, sessions. I think we were one of the last schools to give up uh, anatomy for medical students um, uh, as far as cadaver anatomy. So uh, mm -hmm. those days uh, with our donor program, we were able to uh, get um, very uh, high resolution images of cadavers that were frozen uh, without uh, any sort of uh, trauma to the back, uh, allowing uh, uh, analysis of what's what and where it was uh, at different levels of the spine. So this was a start in uh, resolving what the epidural space, for instance, looks like, what's in the epidural space, how it differs from uh, thoracic to lumbar levels and so forth. In parallel with this, um, MR imaging allowed us to, for instance, measure uh, subarachnoid space contents by sequential images. Uh, I, I think it is still true that I, plus one of my fellows uh, in uh, pain clinic, are the only two people that have had our entire lumbar CSF measured, <laughs> because it takes quite a few acquisitions to, uh, I think we were in the MR bore for a couple hours each to figure out uh, yes. what the CSF volume was and where how it's distributed and so forth. So this was a kind of low-hanging fruit as far as um, well, if you can call it science, and I'm not sure it's really science, it's, uh, well, anatomy has its value, although it's not really uh, what modern science, modern fundable science uh, would be considered. So um, that's how I sort of started. Uh, also, mm -hmm. autopsy material, looking at um, the dimensions of different spinal roots and, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that that wasn't going to be uh, a long-term fundable um, laboratory sort of career. Mm -hmm. uh, although I, I think still there's something, well, there's still good anatomy being done even uh, these days, and it doesn't take a whole lot of money in many cases. But uh, no. uh, if, if we want to get deeper into uh, other topics, such as the physiology of uh, epidural anesthesia um, or of pain, uh, that required uh, fundable sort of projects. So mm -hmm. Um, eventually, I got involved in uh, rabbit neurophysiology, um, how the epidural applied local anesthetics uh, would affect uh, uh, gut vasculature, as an example, uh, or uh, how the different segments uh, would affect uh, sympathetic efferent nerve activity going to the kidney. These were all readily available um, uh, preps. But nobody had ever done an epidural uh, on a rat uh, while they looked at renal blood flow. So uh, this was again in my department where John Campine, uh, our chair, had developed a, a substantial research presence uh, uh, very early on in the history of anesthesia research. So I kind of piggybacked uh, on some of those projects. Eventually, uh, my work settled in on the pathophysiology of painful conditions. And uh, that was about the era where we were figuring out how to do various uh, rotten things to rats uh, that cause uh, re uh, a consistent, repeatable sort of uh, uh, pain behaviors uh, in as much as we could evaluate rats uh, for pain. And um, these uh, various nerve injuries evolved from uh, the so-called CCI to the uh, spared nerve injury, uh, so spinal nerve ligation, uh, perhaps, and all these others which allow us to uh, look at the neurophysiology, both in excised specimens, which others in my lab were already doing at the sympathetic ganglia because our department was very interested in um, autonomic function, um, controlled breathing, uh, dysryth dysrhythmogenesis and so forth. So uh, again, I had the opportunity to uh, go into this unexplored area with lots of expertise because after all, I'd never done a, a graduate school other than medical school, so I was uh, sort of making this up as I went, and uh, had uh, lots of people that were very tolerant. If I didn't mind working hard, they were uh, willing to teach me about uh, how to dissociate neurons, do patch electrophysiology, sharp electrode recordings, and so forth. So uh, those were the days where we really didn't know um, what a nerve injury did that would cause uh, pain thereafter. And um, direct recording, of course, electrophysiology is an ideal way to find out what the neurons are doing. And mm -hmm. I, I still recall it was uh, amazing to me in a thrilling sort of way that you could find, you could look at a single neuron dissociated on a plate doing what neurons do, which is making action potentials uh, or having a transmembrane potential. So for me, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it was productive and eventually... Um, I got it into a fundable state uh, with a lot of help from, in fact, uh, 
uh, SRA uh, because they funded uh, my first um, uh, research, which was a Kohler Award. That was uh, for anatomy, I think. Ah. Uh, that was 1993. Um, they funded uh, both my first and second uh, fellows in the lab. Uh, not big grants, uh, but mm -hmm. it, it's the sort of thing that uh, gives you credibility when you do go looking for big money because uh, you've made use of it. You've um, uh, gotten papers out of uh, prior projects. And so mm -hmm. that sort of develops uh, credibility in the research world, especially if you're a doctor who doesn't have a PhD behind your name. It certainly yeah. helps get those small grants and uh, get it going. Phen phenomenal. Um, um, through all this, you've mentioned a few, few names. You're, you've mentioned already so a few people who helped you on the way. Your greatest mentors uh, in your career and, and, and how, how have they helped you? I would certainly include um, Ben Covino um, because he set the tone for the Brigham. He uh, focused our attentions on these various topics. Mm -hmm. had a sense of academics as something that was um, uh, not only a serious endeavor, but entertaining and, and uh, a, a joy to do. Um, I would have to say Steve Abram uh, probably made the biggest difference in my career. First of all, uh, he was the reason I went to Milwaukee, and here I am still. <laughs> and second of all, um, he was, he is a remarkable uh physician. Uh, he, you know, the pain clinic requires a certain uh, uh, tolerance uh, for stressful environments. Uh, Steve is absolutely unflappable. Um, also, uh, he is incredibly knowledgeable. Um, he would have a type of dismissive manner when we'd say, okay, so uh, what's the latest on uh, herpetic lesions and uh, this uh, 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 therapy for it? And I'd say, well, not really sure. And then he'd recite about 20 minutes of uh, current literature on uh, every, every aspect of the topic. So uh, uh, those features, I first of all thought admirable, but second of all, uh, he helped me a lot. Yeah. Uh, even uh, he went off and did a sabbatical uh, with Tony Yaksh in San Diego. Oh, okay and came back and taught me how to do uh, uh, a type of sensory testing. Von Frey, of course, is the standard. Yep. Von Frey is probably not even pain. Uh, it's a, a tickle or a, uh, an arousal. Yep. Uh, but when we look at uh, a study I eventually did using Steve's technique, which he taught me with um, a pin for testing hyperalgesia and the type of behavior they do, uh, rats don't seem to mind von Frey. They won't avoid a place where it happens to them. So we're not really testing von Frey, uh, pain with von Frey. Uh, mm -hmm. That is the standard, and it's amazing that it's accepted as such, uh, even to this day. I guess it's just easy to do. Yeah. So Steve, Steve taught me um, uh, very early lessons in uh, clinical pain um, uh, assessment and management, as well as uh, some uh, fundamental uh, things he brought back from San Diego. So he, mm -hmm. he certainly got me pointed in the right direction. I've had a lot of valuable colleagues. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, the research world is a bit different than the clinical world is um, you're only as good as your friends are. Uh, you know, in the OR, we work alone. I can do anything. Uh, you know, yeah. I don't usually need help for this, that, except, you know, special techniques and so forth. In the research world, uh, you just can't know enough. Uh, so you find out uh, what uh, Jim Eisenach knows or uh, um, Phil Bromage, who knew everything about um, uh, uh, epidural anesthesia or Yaksha is another name. Um, I think he knows everything about everything to do with pain, uh, an incredibly uh, knowledgeable guy. So uh, I, I wouldn't say whether those are my most valuable, uh, but it's uh, some of the people that yeah. Certainly, uh, were have been very useful. Still, are very useful to me in my research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one question was finishing up with everybody. And if you had to choose some words to describe what Azra means to you, the society, any that come to mind? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, generosity. I I mentioned the grants uh, that mm -hmm. I got. On. Uh, I didn't have much going for me. Uh, I'm not sure what made them think that uh, the investment worth, was worth doing. 
Uh, I'm glad they did, uh, since it certainly helped me, and I know others that have uh, been helped similarly. Um, the other is that I think we, or they, I, uh, uh, ASRA overall, was appropriately cautious uh, about the whole opioid topic that, for instance, destroyed the American Pain Society. And yeah. it was a tidal wave that was uh, uh, engulfing us. And I think many of us saw it coming. Um, I kind of figured, you know, maybe this is time to spend more time on research than in the pain clinic because mm -hmm. it was just a looming disaster. Um, and I recall that uh, in conversations at the ASRA meetings, for instance, um, well, first of all, we had something other than opioids to offer. Yes. <laughs> uh, developing uh, regional anesthesia for perioperative pain uh, was mm -hmm. entirely pointed in the opposite direction. But also, I don't think we uh, went so deep into the um, uh, the enthusiasm of uh, opioids. There's no such thing as opioids, which was a very common view uh, back yeah. in the days. So yeah. I think uh, there, there was a, a very judicious uh, uh, leadership uh, sort of pathway that they must have uh, walked with some care. And we're still here. And if you think back and... Uh, um... Azra and what it's meant to you through through the years. Anything else you'd like to share with folks before we uh, conclude? I I really enjoyed the meetings. I'm not sure why that was uh, different than you know ASA or anything, but um, maybe it wasn't quite in such a hectic large scale. But I think we mm -hmm. also the meetings. Uh, well, regional anesthesia lends itself uh, to hands-on teaching. Um, yeah. So much to my amazement now, I, I would go to meetings with dead body parts. I would, uh, <laughs> I didn't, uh, I, I think we were doing uh, 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 x-ray imaging of your luggage. So I always uh, somehow got it uh, through that. Uh, maybe that was before x-rays because I'd have <laughs> like, like, some arms in a box. Uh, um, and this was, you know, hands-on people really got into it who didn't have access mm -hmm. to that sort of thing uh, in their practice because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they don't have donor programs at many hospitals and we do. No. Um, no. The, the meetings had a, a good vibe. Um, uh, lots of enthusiasm, uh, small group sessions that um, uh, were and I think continue to be uh, very useful and successful. Yep, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, there's something about the, the society and the people you meet there makes it, uh, the meetings are my, uh, my highlight of my year. So I, I, I completely agree. Um, listen, I want to thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if we'll meet at the 200th anniversary, but but this has been a fantastic way to, to talk about commemorate the, oh, the centenary. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Those you. Real much. advancements in uh, somehow uh, <laughs> uh, science or regional anesthesia doing a permanent body uh, uh, preservation. Who knows? That yeah. <laughs> Preservative effects will be pivoted. Maybe that'll be our next uh, scientific paper. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Right.